This video will introduce the inductor. So an inductor is a passive circuit element that stores energy in the form of a magnetic field. And as you can see on the right, inductors typically look something like this. You have a couple leads coming off of them, and then you have windings of coils of wire, typically very close together windings as you see on this um, circular inductor it's a little bit looser but the inductance as we'll see in a little bit is going to be based upon that geometry and the turns of a wire around some kind of a central core. They have a lot of applications. Um, inductors are used in power supplies, transformers, radios, televisions, radars, electric motors, um, in fact, if you've ever made an electromagnet, a um, pretty popular children's experiment where you take a nail and, and wrap some wires around it and create a magnet based on applying a current through that coil, what you were effectively doing was creating an inductor. And so any conductor has some inductance, but coiling the wire up actually enhances that. In some cases, you don't always see the coils. In this case, this is an inductor, but those coils are internal inside the inductor. So very similarly to the differential equation that we had for the current voltage relationship for capacitors, we also have a current voltage relationship for inductors, and that is V equals L di dt. Here L is going to be the inductance, which will be measured in Henry's, and di dt is the change in current with respect to time, and that is going to inform the voltage. One Henry is in units of one volt second per ampere, so it's kind of a compound unit there. And the voltage developed tends to oppose changing flows of current, so it will be very important to think about instantaneous changes. Very similar to the issue we had with instantaneous voltage changes, if you look at this differential equation here, you're going to see that if you had an instantaneous current change, that would, if you had a stepwise current change, make di dt go to infinity, that would make your voltage go to infinity, and as we know, anything that's driven to infinity in electronics is generally a bad idea. So here is a breakdown of the geometry of an inductor, and from that we can compute the inductance. So here L, the inductance, as measured in Henry's, is given based upon N squared, N here is the number of turns of the wire around the centralized core, mu, which is the permeability, very similarly very similar to the epsilon value that we had on the capacitor. And then A is the cross-sectional area in that core right there. And then L is the total length of the inductor itself, the number of coils that you have around that particular length. And the material used for the core has this magnetic property. And so that often helps this be very useful for things like motors. Um, you're basically cre energizing this magnet that allows moving parts to turn around and that's how motors actually work. So based upon the I, V equals L di dt relationship that we have, you can figure out how to get I with a very similar um, integral just like we had with the current voltage relationship for the capacitor, except in this case, you're integrating V and getting I back rather than the other way around as we had with the capacitor. Similarly, the power, instantaneous power is given as V times I, and so V is L di dt, so we take L di dt, multiply that by I, and so you get the power delivered to the inductor is L di dt times i. And the energy stored in an inductor is one half L i squared. So some important properties of inductors very similarly, um, very similar to the special properties that we had for capacitors. For an inductor,
if you look at the current voltage relationship, one thing you'll notice is if you have a constant current through the inductor, the voltage across it's going to be zero. So if you go back to this V equals LDI DT relationship that we have, if you're just applying a steady current, what is the IDT? It goes to zero. And so what that means is if your DI DT is going to zero because you have a steady current, then your voltage drop is going to be zero. And so you have that. The current through an inductor can't change instantaneously. So if you did have a stepwise change in the current, as I mentioned, that would make DI DT go to infinity. That would make your voltage go to infinity. And that doesn't work so well. And an important consideration to that is you don't want to instantaneously turn off um, an inductor. So what do you actually do? Well, if you have a motor, at some point you may want to stop that motor. And a motor oftentimes is built based upon having an inductive coil inside of that motor that gives rise to spinning of the stator and things like that. Well, if you cut that off instantaneously, if you try to instantaneously change the current, then that could create a problem. So what we do with motors is we often put in what are known as flyback diodes. And a diode is a component that allows current to flow in only one direction. And what that will do is basically give an escape path for that current. So as the current is trying to spin way down and ultimately get, give down, get down to zero, what we're actually trying to do is not allow the inductor current to instantaneously change down to zero when you cut the power off. And so that will allow some of the energy that is stored in the inductor to dissipate through a flyback diode that will be put in parallel with the inductor. That is very important because instantly turning off or instantly trying to turn on an inductor could give some problems as the current has an instantaneous change. So just like we talked about with an ideal capacitor, remember in an ideal capacitor there is actually a little bit of parasitic resistance inside of there. The, and that was in parallel. And so what happens with the capacitor, an ideal capacitor would just store charge forever. You charge it up, put it on a shelf, come back five years later and it should have that same charge. But because there is some parasitic resistance in there, that charge will actually dissipate. It will form a series circuit um, where you have, well, it's really in parallel, but since it's just two elements, you can think about it as either parallel or series, where you have the capacitor's charge dissipating through the resistor and ultimately that energy getting lost in the form of heat. Well, with the ideal inductor, ideally it would have no resistance and so it wouldn't dissipate any of the energy stored within it. In the real world, inductors have to be made of real wires and even though copper or any other material that you're going to make wire out of is an excellent conductor, there is still some resistance to it. And so what that means is when you're trying to design transformers, um, you need to account for the loss in those transformers, the loss in the inductor, based upon the windings in the coils. So you can think about how much resistance you have um, over a particular distance. Remember, resistance can be calculated based upon the length of a particular um, component, so in that case a wire and the cross-sectional area, and looking at the resistivity of that particular property. And so if you think about that, it actually can be modeled as a resistor in series with the inductor, even though that resistance is really just spread all across the inductor in the form of resistive losses inside of the inductor coils. You also have, if you're thinking about the real world, some small capacitance between each of the windings. So if you have one winding right next to another, you actually have what effectively amounts to a couple parallel plates. Um, if you think about the side of a wire right next to the side of another wire, 
you have two very small wire sized parallel metal objects and they can effectively be treated as a capacitor. So an inductor actually also has a small capacitance that should be accounted for. And so those are small characteristics but that um, internal resistance and the internal capacitance may matter particularly at very high frequencies. So if you start getting into very high frequency circuits those are things that you're going to need to account for. Now just as we did before in the previous video we wanted to think about how do we combine um, capacitors in parallel and series. We also want to think about how we would do that with inductors in parallel and series. And to illustrate that we can just think about Kirchhoff's voltage law. And so here let's say you had some voltage V here and you had individual voltage drops across each of these um, inductors in series you might think about, okay, what is one equivalent inductor, LEQ, that I could use to represent that? And so we know V is going to be V1 plus V2 plus V3 all the way up through however many N um, inductors you have there. And now if we put that in terms of the differential equation, remember V equals L di dt. Well, everything is in series, so all of those inductors have the same current through them. So L1 di dt plus L2 di dt plus L3 di dt, etc. That gives you each of your individual voltage drops. Well, what we can do is factor out a di dt in there, and then we just get the summation of all of our L's. And if we take this as being our equivalent inductance, what we notice is that the equivalent inductance is just the sum of all of the inductors. So inductors in series add together just like resistors in series do. Now let's see if the parallel relationship is the same as the parallel relationship for resistors. Well if we apply a voltage and have inductors in parallel all the way down we will notice that the current coming through here has to be equal to the sum of all of the branch currents. And so if we get down into here, what we're going to end up with is this I is equal to the 1 over L times the integral of the voltage with respect to time. And so what we'll see is this ends up being the summation of the reciprocals of each of the inductances. And as it turns out, you do have the same kind of relationship in parallel with inductors as you do with resistors. So um, this is how you can add up inductors that are in parallel. They add the same exact way that parallel resistors add. So here's the equivalent. 1 over LEQ is equal to the sum of the reciprocals of each of the individual inductances. So here is a good summary of capacitors and inductors. So the voltage current relationship, we also can throw resistors into this chart. Voltage current relationship for a resistor, Ohm's law. When you have a capacitor, remember that it has I equals C dV dt, and if you want to get back to V, you of course integrate both sides and you end up with the integral that you see here. And our base differential equation for the inductor is V equals L di dt. And then you can also flip that back around. You have this opposite relationship for um, current and voltage in the capacitor and the inductor. Here, this is just an algebraic manipulation of Ohm's law. The power is VI, no matter which way you go. So you can write it as V times I, or I squared R, V squared over R. This is what you end up with um, for the energy stored within a capacitor, one half C V squared, and the energy stored within an inductor, one half L I squared. And so you can see that energy is stored in a capacitor by raising the potential. The potential in there talks about how much energy is stored. Here, energy is stored in an inductor based on its inductor current. How do you add components in series? Well, for resistors, and inductors, you just add them up. 
If you have series elements of capacitors, this would be just two of them, um, but you have that reciprocal relationship. Parallel, just the exact opposite. So the inductor and the resistor have that reciprocal relationship. The capacitor in parallel just adds. And then you want to think about how does this behave at DC? Well, resistors, um, as we've been working with in DC, they just behave like a resistor and they scale accordingly. But if you have DC here for a capacitor, once it gets to a steady state and is fully charged, that capacitor starts behaving like an open circuit. At steady state in an inductor, that current is no longer going to be changing and so it is going to behave like a short circuit and basically behaving like a wire. In terms of what cannot change abruptly, resistors just go with the flow. They're fine with voltage or current changes happening abruptly, but capacitors cannot change their voltage abruptly and inductors cannot change their current abruptly. If you have stepwise changes, that makes the other quantity go to infinity and that's just not a good day.